Welcome to the Pursuit of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Clint Murphy. My goal is for each of us to grow personally, professionally, and financially one conversation at a time. To do that, we will have conversations with subject matter experts across a variety of modalities. My job as your host will be to dig out those golden nuggets of wisdom that will facilitate our growth. Join me on this pursuit. Stephanie Hunter is a shadow work facilitator and transformational mentor in Vancouver, BC and online. She leads programs in women's groups and semi-annual conscious relationship trainings. She has a gift for translating woo-woo into practical terms, for bringing humor into hard work, and for radical acceptance. Join Stephanie and I as we talk healthy boundaries, relationships, shadow work, and more. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Stephanie, welcome to the pursuit of learning. One of the questions I like to dive in right away with my guests is to understand what are two to three things that are really interesting and motivating you right now and that you'd love to ensure we have a little bit of airtime today for the listeners. Mm, What's motivating me right now? Not making assumptions often motivates me. So that means exploring my mind and my assumptions, which crop up, you know, a million a day, approximately. (laughs) Hmm. Interconnectedness. So a lot of those assumptions are related to things that keep us out of connection with each other. I'm interested personally in overcoming that as much as possible and supporting other people in those endeavors. And then I think one of the binding webs of both of those things is radical honesty, which is primarily an endeavor to tackle with oneself, and then it folds out into your life and relationships. So being very realistic about what it is you believe, what you want, admitting those things out loud to yourself, exploring what you want and believe outside of, you know, the expectations of other important figures in your life who may have influenced your ideas on those matters. I love it. Diving right in. Okay. So one of the things you talked about right there was the radical, honest self-expression. And you also do a fair amount of work with compassionate self-acceptance Can you dive into, for our listeners, each one of those individually and start to unpack what they look like, and then we'll we'll spend a fair bit of time on those? Well, they're totally intertwined. We can't be honest with ourselves if we're not going to give ourselves a passionate response. You know, imagine a friend bringing a problem to you, and you tell them to piss off. Hey, what kind of language can I use on our podcast here today? Whatever you like. (laughs) Great. Being compassionate with yourself really just means being open and curious. You know, anything that is an open curiosity is something that's probably not terribly compassionate. Um, Compassion being that you can feel and experience sympathetic emotions uh, for yourself and for other people. So I think radical honesty can get... (laughs) Very confusing, especially for for those of us who've not been able to admit to ourselves who we are and how we want to live our lives. We've been hiding, and typically that means withholding truth from other people. Uh, And really to master withholding truth from other people, you've got to get pretty good at withholding it from yourself as well. And so how does someone go about uncovering that truth that they're hiding from themselves? Slowing down. There are so many ways to do that slowing down and getting involved in a compassionate self-inquiry process. So there's also a lot of ways to do that. My preferred methods are meditation and shadow work. Meditation is pretty obvious, but I think we also get confused there. I mean, silent meditation where you're noticing your mind. There's also a lot of good use um, in guided meditations, but those are more therapeutic than mind calming. 
mind quieting. Uh, and the shadow work, so shadow work is any exploration of your inner workings, your mind, uh, emotions, feelings, thoughts, beliefs that you've hidden or repressed, uh, generally because you're looking to be accepted by peers, loved ones, family. Uh, and you've learned over the course of your life that for whatever reason, these thoughts, feelings, or beliefs are unsafe to share. Therapies, journaling, all that sort of thing, all will dive into shadow work. Any inner exploration of hidden corners is shadow work. My preferred method is experiential group shadow work, where all of the wounds we've developed in relationship, we are healing them and processing them in relationship with other people. Other people and relationships are the best mirrors we have to expose our inner workings. So that's my favorite. There's a lot to unpack on that one, Stephanie. You, one of the things you said there that I love and you write about this is that doing the work by yourself, reading, studying, just continuing to do more and more work is really no replacement for the in real life work. Why is that? And how can we work with others on our shadow work to uncover our hidden drivers, if you will. Mm -hmm. So all the study and the reading that we do and therapy, generally like one-on-one -on -one therapies are, are like this. They're dealing with our intellectual minds. They're dealing with our thoughts. They don't do much to touch other than the fact of, you know, remembering things and having feelings surface in that way and sort of recalling memory form. You're not facing all the energies that are in your body when you're interacting with other people. So everyone's had the experience of having a conversation. They, they know they're going to have this difficult conversation. They plan it in advance, right? You figure out all the things you're going to say. You're firm in your position and then you get face to face with the person and it's completely different than you planned because you're now using your whole body and you're facing their body and there's your own energy and there's their energy and there's the energy you created together. And if we can't sort out a way to be present for that moment, uh, if we're only present with everything we've figured out in our own heads, uh, it's not going to work out the way we expect. So how does someone become comfortable in that moment? Because difficult conversations, I think you and I probably both agree, are a significant roadblock for the vast majority of people. One of the things almost everyone tries to avoid, whether it's with colleagues, loved ones, friends, family, is actually having difficult conversations. How do we get comfortable with being uncomfortable? Well, so getting radically honest about how we feel about that discomfort is a start and slowing down. So really, when we break down the fears of having difficult conversations, we realize that our deep fear is that we're going to die. Having this difficult conversation the root of it is that we actually think we're going to die. We think that we're going to be abandoned, rejected, thrown to the wolves, and we'll perish alone in the forest. That's our, our biological response to a difficult conversation. So if you work backwards from that, it comes down to getting comfortable with feelings, coming to understand that we actually are managing all these feelings and sensations in our bodies. We're just afraid of them. We're afraid we can't manage them all the while we're managing them and in some way. Usually we're bottling them up. They're, they're still there. That's still managing them. There are just now different ways we can learn to process, to learn that we can actually contain this amount of energy and sensation in our bodies. They won't kill us. They won't in all likelihood make us throw up or, you know, maybe they'll make us cry. There's a lot of steps to coming face to face with feelings and recognizing how much those affect our lives and relationships and the capacity to have those difficult conversations. So practice. In my experience as someone who was a very shut down doormat with a lot of latent anger I hadn't tapped into, I wasn't aware of, I thought I was quite expressive. I've always had a big personality, but I was really shut down in a lot of ways. And it took a lot of role modeling, a lot of in-depth shadow work, a lot of seeing women who had clear boundaries, you know, language that I use today, I, I could understand the words five years ago, but I didn't fundamentally understand the concepts at all. And it took a good two years of practice to just start feeling safe 
that feelings sort of existed within me. And really another two or three years to process those, to understand what they felt like in my body, to discover the parts physically that they were attempting to overwhelm, you know, but your ego will throw up a lot of defenses against all of these challenging feelings that we've been practicing protecting ourselves against for, you know, in my case, 35 years. And by about year 39, I think I started to really allow feelings to fill my body. And it's scary. So learning to trust yourself, you know, it's like learning to ride a bike. You have to learn to trust yourself. You have to build new muscles. You have to practice. There's a lot of things I heard in there that I want to explore that I've seen in some of your writing and speaking. And one of the things you talked about was feeling safe. And I've seen you write that there's a difference between being safe and feeling safe and that it's often uncomfortable to open up. But when you're safe to be received, it is important to practice and grow that muscle, which is what you were just speaking to there with the practice and growth. Can you take us through the difference between feeling safe and being safe and how we can move? I'm assuming we actually want to be safe as opposed to feel safe. And how do we move from one to the other? Right. Well, I think we want both. And I think often now as adults in personal growth work, we tend to be safe and we tend to not feel safe, um, which is often a method our ego will employ to help us avoid feeling all these uncomfortable feelings, right? So we are safe. We just don't feel safe. Yeah. I mean, if you're safe, you're safe. You know, if somebody is around who's going to beat you up or try to kill you or jeer at you uncomfortably, or you know if you're safe or not. If you're in a therapeutic group setting with a bunch of people who've agreed that this is a container of shared confidential vulnerability, you're safe, you know? But because we're exploring uncomfortable personal issues, all of those feelings of unsafety that are paired in your mind with those issues are going to come up. And it has to be a conscious choice. It has to be a physical self-regulatory practice to soothe ourselves and to remember that we're safe in those moments. And it takes practice, right? The more we practice doing that, the more we surround ourselves with people and situations that are safe for us. It takes a long time to let our systems soothe. You know, years of heightened anxiety and fear are going to take years to unwind in your body and to be spending time in your parasympathetic system and really soothing yourself takes practice. And for me and other people, I know years of, of work to actually start feeling safe and to trust that. And so learning to really just relax your system and rest in that safety of the container that you're in and be willing to let out what you've been locking in for sometimes. I mean, you said you really started to feel safe at around 39. So there were probably things that you're locking in for 30 plus years that we're not letting out. Oh, for sure. And those are the, the big obvious things, but there's so many at the microscopic level, like we're, we're clenched up most of the time. If you stop and pause in any moment, you will discover there's definitely something you can release or relax in your body anytime, really. I feel like having a meditation and just releasing things as you say that, that's beautifully said. There's always something that we're holding on to. Two things that you talked about, and I'd love to explore these for the listener because they're, they're words that get used in men's work, women's work, shadow work, are the container and holding space. Can you enlighten the listeners when we use those words, what we're meaning, and holding space, the difference between what a lot of people think is holding space and how you should be holding space when you're doing this work for someone or when you're listening to someone who's in grief or going through physical issues and they're trying to have a conversation with you. How should we really be holding space for that person? Yeah, I appreciate this because words and terminology get co-opted in ways that I find really irritating. And then people are just using words and not understanding what they mean. And it's irritating. So container, this is just the whatever group we've created, whatever arrangement we've got, whatever energy and guidelines we've created 
with ourselves. So, I mean, you can hold space, which really just means letting people have their experience and witnessing it in any sort of container. It can be a container of two people or a group of people. There's usually some common agreement or understanding or purpose. Uh, and usually there's, um, in this sort of shadow work, spiritual work, there's uh, some sort of guiding principle and guidelines. So in my groups, these are things like radical honesty as much as we're able to we agree to express ourselves we agree to be vulnerable even when that's uncomfortable we agree to speak up and call each other on things you know if we see ourselves hiding in ego we agree to call each other on that we agree to connect with each other when we feel freaked out instead of receding and so that container you know when you're in a group of people you're never in exactly that same grouping or energy or time again you know it's a unique space that you're in in every moment and so making sure that a container is well described you know if you get into a, a room full of people and you don't have any agreements it's not really a container if you don't understand why you're all there and what you're all doing there you're not really containing anything you're just swirling around together right and holding space within those sorts of agreements. And again, this is in this personal growth and shadow work context. Holding space means allowing the other person to have their experience without interfering and with witnessing both them and your experience of them. So as an example, you'll often see people in, in a dyad. So they're sitting in a pairing and they're doing some sort of prompts where they're exposing parts of themselves and perhaps the person who's exposing parts of themselves might uh, we're talking figurative parts <laughs> not not literal parts it's not not the 80s anymore they might start crying and the person who is holding space for them might want to make them feel better or soothe them or they might feel really anxious about tears and not know how to deal with it so they might get all giggly or you know whatever their response is to tears in this moment, the agreement and part of the container is that someone's going to do something and you're going to have a reaction. Your job is to hold the space for them. Your, your job right now is witnessing them having their experience. And it's inevitable that you're going to be having your own inner experience. So just witnessing that as well, letting it go, not getting wrapped up in it overly. Uh, sometimes you won't be able to help that. It's a, a learning curve. But practicing being as present as you can for the other person and recognizing that you're going to be having an inner experience as well and you're sort of agreeing to put that down to hold space for this other person and witness and stephanie is it reasonable to say as well that noticing your reaction to their sharing or to their emotions may be something for you to explore further down the road when you said they're crying and you may giggle, what in you is afraid of crying? That might be some like, why do I giggle when someone cries? Why do I laugh when you tell me to stare another man in the eyes and hold my ground? Why do I chuckle? What is there that doesn't allow me to do the exercise? Absolutely. Yeah, the big question for me in shadow work, you can wrap it up into what am I doing and why am I doing it? And those are always useful things to explore. If, if you're noticing any reactions coming up in you, there's something in there that will be valuable for you to explore in some way. It's a great one. I'm writing, writing that one down. It's also worthwhile noticing these things because in real time, when you have these sort of rote responses that are just automatic to you and you're not exploring them, that also doesn't give you the opportunity to explore uh, when you actually need to. So there might be situations that arise in life where you have this rote response and you think, oh, well, this is the way I feel in response to this. But if you go deeper and you actually give attention to how do I feel about this thing, you might discover that something you thought you were anxious about, you actually feel excited about, or something you thought you didn't like actually feels really good in your body. So conscious attention is invaluable because we're operating on so many unexplored assumptions all the time. And it feels like this is the conversation. I have to share it. The quote we use most often on the podcast, regardless of what we're talking about, it actually comes up, Stephanie, is the concept 
that until we make the unconscious conscious, we will be guided by it and call it fate by Carl Jung, which I think many of us look to sort of as the, you know, one of the leaders or founders of of the shadow work movement. So when you're having that feeling or that rote response, how do you do that exercise of digging deeper into what's driving it? And is part of that your statement earlier of just slowing yourself down and maybe trying to build a bigger response between the stimulus and the response and exploring what's happening? So starting to widen the gap between stimulus and response and then do some work to say, before I respond, why am I thinking that I should respond this way and how should I really respond? I'm not sure if that makes sense that way. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the meditation is what gives you space uh, to notice your response before it happens, gives you space to choose an alternative response. And then when it comes to breaking patterns of behavior, I'm a fairly intense woman. I'm into extremes. This has been part of my wounding and patterns as well that I've had to work through is why am I so extreme? So swinging the pendulum the other direction, you know, if you find yourself in a pattern, just do anything else, anything else you can. So me as an extremist, I'm like, do the opposite. You know, my inclination would be to do the opposite. Some people would just do anything else. You know, if your inclination is to get angry and yell at your partner, stand on one foot instead, go have a Twizzlers, like do something else at all to interrupt the pattern and and give you your brain back. The therapeutic element, the self-discovery element that's going to give you different options. This is part of why I love doing this work uh, with other people is because they provide you so many options that you couldn't conceive of yourself. They're so permission giving. You know, when you meet someone who has a reaction you have that you find personally revolting in yourself and they're loving and accepting of it and you go, oh my God, you know, is that an option? Could I love myself for this thing? And you'll often find that's the case. So pattern recognition, a a conscious exploration of what your patterns are. It's helpful to explore why our patterns are the way they are, but knowing why doesn't change a thing necessarily. It might give you some of the foundational oomph to make some change, but our behaviors are constant choices that we make. So meditation being key in slowing down and giving you space to choose a different way, at least enough pattern recognition to notice that you're in a pattern, and then making a choice to do something different and hopefully doing some work and learning what healthy different options are uh, so that you can be making choices that actually feel good for your life and relationships. You nailed something right there that always jumps out at me, and it ties it ties a little to something else you've written about, which is the concept that understanding inner work and keeping an inner work practice are two different things that yield different results. And Stephanie, what I often see is a lot of people read, they study, they learn, but they don't actually do the work. And so to your point, mm-hmm, they just start teaching. Yeah, sure. But it's, you know, it's that idea that, okay, now I know why. Okay, but what are you going to do about it? And how do people make that shift from the studying, the learning, the understanding to the actual doing? Why is it so hard to do? Oh, the same reason it's hard to do anything. We're lazy. We want someone else to do it for us. Uh, We don't have time. It's scary. You know, there's so many reasons not to do things. We might lose all of our relationships and, you know, all of our paradigms might just shift completely and we might be completely adrift in this confusing existence where uncertainty is the only thing that's real. (laughs) So many reasons to avoid the doing. And are a lot, when I'm hearing all these reasons, these sound like reasons that I'm telling myself in my head not to do it. They don't necessarily sound like legitimate reasons not to do it. Is that fair to say? Definitely, yeah. And I think as a married man with a family, it might be easier to not do the things. For people who are 
disconnected and wanting connection, they're going to have to do this, right? People don't come to this work because they're just looking for a new hobby. They usually come to this work because something in their life and typically their relationships is making them deeply unhappy and they want some change. So that's a great question, Stephanie. And we'll throw this one back to you is why did you come to this work? Why did you start it? Exactly what I just said. I was in a very intense, fiery relationship that was based entirely on our assumptions about each other. Neither of us were present with each other so much as we were present for our ideas about what a relationship should look like, uh, which we both had different ideas of, by the way. Uh, and we actually did two rounds of conscious relationship training together before our relationship blew up, before we really realized that it was no bueno. <laughs> It was intense, you know, we were wrapped up completely in stories and we're not aware that that was a thing, you know, we just wanted the other one to be better at making the other one happy, which is also not really a thing. So it was a huge learning curve. This was a guy I had known for a really long time. I'd actually dated him when we were 14 and we found each other again 20 years later and it was like a movie, which is exactly the problem, right? It was a movie. We had a pre-written script. Nobody was casting each other properly. It was lunacy. And, you know, about three years of trying to force each other into different uh, roles, which none of us wanted to play. And it's just sort of a baffling, angering process when you're trying to stuff somebody into a box and they just won't go, you know? <laughs> and they're saying they want you to be happy and all this stuff. And, it's just not working out. This is what most people find in, in deeply codependent relationships. Such a wonderful way to describe it is being in a box. And sometimes you may even realize you've been in that box for 24 years. And then you may say, okay, I think I need to get out of this box. And what's my plan to get out? When am I going to get out? And what does that look like? Yeah, and it should be said that some people are perfectly happy in boxes or perfectly happy being unhappy, and we need all of these people to keep the world spinning. Mm -hmm. For for some people, what might seem like a box and might seem like a, a jail for other people is very comfortable. They might be quite happy in that position, and so to each their own and recognizing that w what we want may not be what another person wants and, and being okay with that. Now, what kept you doing the work? So you came to the work for that reason, and you've been doing the work for a fair amount of time now. And you lead women's circles, you lead shadow work, you teach conscious relationship training. So what kept you doing the work? Well, I actually think that he was here to lead me to the work, which is completely my thing. And since I've started doing the work, you know, all of my astrological charts, Western and Vedic, and my human design and gene keys, and all of these ways of measuring how you are sort of cosmically. They all say that I'm supposed to be here doing this work in order to figure myself out. So I've always felt very inwardly interested, um, compelled is a good word. I come from a family where we have always sort of explored and reported our minds to each other. It's always been like an external thing that, hey, look at this nonsense my mind just produced. Isn't that entertaining? And we've always sort of talked in those terms. And there's always been a thread of sort of, oh, look at this interesting thing that's happening in the world, you know? So I, I very much approach things with that mindset of, oh, what's happening here? This is interesting. And oh, look what my mind's doing. And so to be given that framework just resonated with me so much. And I'm no stranger to spiritual ideas, and none of them really sat well with me. There was sort of too much woo-woo or religion or something about the language and what I was making words mean and connotations I had uh, didn't feel good. And it wasn't until I met Phil Misselberger, um, which was a, totally a fluke, a beautiful coincidence, he resonated with me so much. I realized a couple of years later that part of the reason why was because he wasn't smiling for no damn reason. You know, he, he was just there present and it's so trustable. He's someone who's going to tell you what's going on 
and it's not just going to be chipper and friendly. I came from a long background in social work where everybody's smiling just because we all think we need to smile all the time. It's phony and false, and I didn't trust it. So I, I came to associate um, excess smiling and friendliness with something that was going to blow up at some point. You know, these people aren't just happy, shiny, love and light. They're going to blow. And there's something darker underneath the surface that I don't quite trust. So leading with that darkness and having that darkness or, you know, pick your word as part of the light, you know, this is yin and yang, light and dark. This is interchangeable. It's all here. Let's acknowledge that. I, I really trust that deeply. And this holistic approach feels so permission giving for myself. And it's improved every aspect of my life and relationships. And I feel deeply connected now in ways that I haven't um, to people, to existence, to my purpose. And I just want to show everybody that that's completely possible if that's something you want. Wow. That is something I want. And I've mentioned to you that I, I want to take the conscious relationship training. So definitely on the list to do the so stephanie earlier you were talking about boundaries and one of the things that you've written is that healthy boundaries are simply a manifestation of knowing and honoring yourself can you take us through that and how it works how it works yes because in a, in, a, in a lot of the work that I do in, in men's work, a lot of us seem to have very unhealthy, unhealthy boundary setting with our partners, with our family, with our parents, with our colleagues, with our bosses. How do we, how do we get to know ourselves enough to establish healthy boundaries that we want to hold? Yeah, so knowing what the boundaries are and establishing them and finding them honored are probably different things. But they probably come together the more you get to know yourself and orient your life around people and things that, that feel good. Um, so again, the first step is knowing your feelings, knowing what feels good, knowing what feels bad. An initial exploration of your relationships. Where do you feel like people honor you and your requests and your needs? Where does that just happen? Where do you have to ask for it? Where do you get pushback? Knowing where I end and you begin is so important, especially in relationship, you're going to have conflicting priorities, right? Your boundary might be that you want, I don't know, extra alone time to recharge, but you might also have a need to make your partner happy. And that could be a shifting boundary, you know, depending on what's happening for your partner that day, you might want to say, you know what, I'm going to defer my alone time because I want to be here to love and support you in this moment. Or you might say, you know, I need my alone time and actually, babe, you're involved in some anxious attachment right now. And I'd love for you to connect with your girlfriends while I go to my man cave and do whatever it is I need to do. And and people actually respect your your boundaries, especially when they're for yourself, you know, that that self possession, finding your center, knowing and honoring what you need, is also a practice and a muscle to build. Um, so the first lessons that myself, so I, I lead uh, the weekly women's group with my co facilitator, Georgiana Lee, who's wonderful. And we assign this thing about self trusting and boundary making, which is simply pee when you have to pee drink when you're thirsty. That's your first step. And it sounds really basic, but it is establishing trust with yourself. And it's establishing that you know what your needs are and that you're going to address them. And that is like, this is the low reps starting your high intensity interval training of self-discovery work, just peeing and drinking water. So just keeping it simple to start with, just learning to recognize in your body that feeling that says I have to go to the washroom yeah, and I'm not going to sit in this meeting for an hour and hold it for all of you. I'm going to just excuse myself because I have to go to the washroom. Mm, oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And you'll find with something so simple as that, you will have a million stories attached to it. So like, 
There will be a, a washroom in the meeting boundary that if you put some attention here, you'll discover. If it's just my need to pee and I know I can hold it, maybe I'll ignore my needs. But if it's like you've had a recent surgery and there's some urgency and you've got to go, no problem excusing yourself. You're just like, excuse me, I have to attend to something. Uh, you know, people tend to respect that. So it's interesting to see where where your boundary becomes more pliable and based on what. So you might discover that you actually have given yourself permission to express these boundaries, but only in certain instances. And you can sort of spread that permission if you give some conscious attention to it. Yeah, versus waiting until that moment when it's, I have to go. <laughs> like if I, if I don't get there, I'm done. And, and why do I feel the need to wait that long? Why don't I feel the need to be comfortable with that person who I've been, I could have been working with them for seven years. Why do I not feel comfortable just saying, hey, Ted, I'm just going to take a quick washroom break. I'll be right back. Totally. And just to add another layer of like existential cosmic thing to this, because deeply, I believe that everything is as it should be and that flow of energy is really important. It's an ironic pee joke, their flow. So when you suddenly realize you have to pee, I actually believe that if you ignore it, you're missing some opportunity. Uh, and if you go with the flow and get up and pee when you have to, maybe you're going to meet Steven Tyler on the way to the bathroom, or maybe you're going to find a hundred dollar bill on the floor, or maybe you're going to miss some, you know, a, I don't know, something that you didn't want to be in the meeting for. You know, there's, I think, a lot of importance of honoring ourselves and the moment. Yeah. And Stephanie, I, I'll, I'll use an example that ties into that because you know from our messaging the other day that we just got a new puppy that we brought home. And uh, she doesn't hold it, right? She, when she has to go, she, she starts to give a little bit of a whine, like, and that's her, hey, I'm telling you, here's my healthy boundary. If you don't address it, in the next few minutes, we both know what's going to happen. And she's been great about waiting till she gets outside. And, you know, even this morning to your, when we were talking about holding space and recognizing what we're seeing, she went pee in the backyard and we started to go back in the house and she veered to the left a little and she started doing a little bit of sniffing. And I thought, Immediately, I said, oh, I think she has to do a number two. And then I ignored it. And I said, come on in. And probably no surprise, 10 minutes later, my kids called me and said, hey, Stella went and did a number two in the living room. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to get mad at her. I thought, damn, you saw something there. You knew and you ignored that intuition because you wanted to get inside out of the rain and be comfortable. And so it's it's seeing that and honoring it, right? And and not taking the easy route and just going inside. But total digression on the on the, on the peeing with the puppy. Do you have carpets or hardwood? We have hardwood, so it wasn't too bad. It was a pretty easy 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 cleanup, and she she's pretty small right now, so it's it's not too offensive yet. She's going to be a big girl, so eventually it'll be uh, eventually it'll be very problematic. But uh, she's getting much better already. Like she's, you know, last night she was up till was the first night where she she had about a four hour stretch. So relative to when we talked a few days ago, she's she's quickly just settling into where she's sleeping at night and saying, OK, I feel safe enough. I can I can sleep for a couple more hours before I feel the need to wake up and, and cry. You know, dogs are actually really good at that, that recognizing that they're in a safe place and opening up to it, you know, not so much holding grudges, not so much mind and brain interfering with um, current feelings of safety that exist. They often feel as well, Stephanie, like they're good with that for us, right? One of the things I find with a puppy or a dog is it's really hard to be in your head to be thinking about this and thinking about that when they're sitting in your lap and they just want to be pet and, you know, they're rolling onto their back and saying, Hey, give me belly rubs. It's really hard to worry about the myriad of things that are swirling in your mind. If, if you're a person who has things swirling in your mind, I have two kids. One of them says, no, that doesn't happen for me. It's pretty quiet in there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I experience that sometimes, but your dogs are, are, the embodiment of presence in all moments. It's delightful. 
Exactly. That's a great way to say it. Thank you for that. The so the earlier you were also talking about and, and I'll use the word pedantic with word choices and what they mean. And tying to what we were just talking about with boundaries, I thought it was beautiful when you said there's a powerful and empowering difference between that's unacceptable and I don't accept that. Can you take us through what that difference is for you? And how do I learn to do the right one? Yeah. Man, I see this so much with women who are new to dating somebody and they want this person to be the person that they want. And when the person reveals that they're maybe not that person, a woman might say, or anyone might say, I, I'm not accepting your behavior. You're going to have to change your behavior, which is a completely different thing than saying, I'm not into this and turning the other direction, you know? We, instead of claiming our boundaries for ourselves and just recognizing what we do and don't want, we make demands on other people to give us what we do and don't want. Instead of just going wherever it is that what we want is, you know, which would be a lot easier and I think is also a very important part of this flow. The more we spend time in consternation in other people's business trying to change things to make ourselves feel good, the less we're putting energy towards things that feel good, you know, and the more I surround myself with things and people that feel good, surprise, surprise, my life feels really good. So this, this ties to the concept then that you, you can't heal your partner, right? You can't change them effectively, love them as they are or leave them. Can you tell us why, what you mean by that? And why is it such a common issue in conscious relationship training? you can do your inner work with anyone. Often I think people leave relationships for the wrong reasons when they could in fact be going deeper and getting closer. And really people are using relationships as distractions from themselves. So if you're really wanting to be consciously aware with yourself, this partner that you maybe want to leave, you're going to discover they're actually a mirror for things that you don't want to look at and that are making you uncomfortable. You can go deeper there. You can get more connected with them than you've ever been. Uh, or you can leave and probably start your pattern over again with another person. What was the question? The concept of, of loving them or leaving them in try it versus trying to effectively so many of us try to change the other person versus just accepting and loving them as they are. Yeah, for sure. I think another thing that I want to say about that is uh, trust issues is what comes to mind. So sometimes people will find themselves in situations where they're distrusting of their partner for whatever reason. Maybe somebody's cheated in the current relationship, or maybe you've come from a relationship where there was a lot of cheating and you're bringing trust issues forward with you. When you're choosing to be in a partnership with somebody. This means choosing to put those trust issues down. It means choosing to trust and love the person. And I think often people will unfortunately issue those trust issues as a challenge uh, for the other person instead of for themselves to overcome. So they'll always constantly be looking for the partner to prove trust. And in fact, what they're looking for is proving that they're distrustful. So they're subconsciously always going to be looking for reasons to distrust that person, uh, which makes for a doomed relationship, right? Love them or leave them. If you're choosing to be with somebody that you don't trust, that's crazy. <laughs> you need to either put your trust issues down and choose to trust them and choose to disbelieve your distrust issues when they come up or, you know, set each other free and go do your inner work. And you may even need to do the work to figure out why don't I trust? Yeah, definitely. And that's where you'll get into the therapy and the reading and figuring out all these things. And, and you'll still face the same energetic body-based issues when you get back into relationship. You'll still need to, maybe you'll have a better understanding of why and what it is, which is important. And you'll still need to interrupt those patterns every time they come up and consciously choose to move back into love and trust and connection, which will mean being radically honest with yourself and with your partner 
uh, and returning to that loving container you've created together despite each other's myriad issues. Do you see this issue, I'm going to bring up an issue, do you see it more with men or with women? And how how do you help people to avoid doing this? And, And what I see a lot with people in relationship is you're not necessarily in relationship with the person that you're in the relationship with. You may be in the relationship with who you think that person could be, right? So you're picking a partner based on the potential versus the reality, which I'm assuming you don't want to do. Could be wrong, right? Depends on what you like. You, you may, yeah, you may like projects and you may like trying to change people. Well, and you may just be in a relationship for the sake of being in a relationship. You know, there are people who get together and say, we want a relationship. We're agreeing to do that together. Let's make it work. And then there are people who, you know, actually get to know each other and there's just a connection. Relationships just occur. You suddenly have energy for each other and you want to spend time together and and that's that. A slow burn. And if you you do see someone who's consistently getting into relationships with people that aren't what they want and they think they can get them there, right? Maybe they're not what I want, but I can get them there. How do you work with them to say, maybe we should focus on finding what you want and finding a person who matches that versus continuously pairing up with someone who doesn't meet that, who you then try to train, if you will. Right. I'll never be directing people outwards to look at their partners or other potential partners. It's always going to be inward. So if somebody's picking somebody that they don't want consciously, they want them subconsciously. You know, there's there's what we want, and then there's what we want to want. Um, and someone who's uh, choosing a partner based on their potential, I mean, there's so much to unpack there that it'd be many therapy sessions, I, I would imagine. But really what's going on there is that someone's feeling unworthy of a partner that suits them. Or they're feeling like they need to rescue or caretake, which is usually a reflection of wanting to be rescued or caretaken themselves. And, you know, we're often doing the opposite of what's really going on for us. Uh, And we're often making things a lot more complicated for ourselves than they need to be because we just don't deep down think we're worthy of ease and joy, you know, or we've grown up in some family system where that's the dynamic that we're comfortable with. And even though we're unhappy, we're just so damn comfortable uh, that we're not going to change. And we won't change till it's so uncomfortable that we have to. It's normal. So is it fair to say with a, with conscious relationship training that there's a fair amount of shadow work involved in the conscious relationship training itself? Yeah, it's all shadow work. All shadow work. Okay. This makes a lot of sense then because you're really trying to get at the core of why do I want what I want? And uncovering the why. Yeah, and, and and it's exposing. You know, it's that energetic exposition we talked about. When you have to sit in front of a room full of people and tell them who you are, you're doing shadow work, whether you're aware of it or not. And this may align a little with the concept of he's just not that into you, or she's just not that into you, but you write that if it's one-sided, it's not a relationship. What do you mean by that, Stephanie? Hmm. Well, there are a lot of people who are hoping that relationships will flourish uh, and it's a one-sided affair, you know. Often people will feel they've connected with someone and they'll be putting lots of effort in uh, and not getting that reciprocated. And so really it's just a matter of noticing what's going on and accepting reality instead of trying to push your hopes and dreams on people. You see this a lot with especially anxious attachment folks who, uh, you know, want a lot of maybe communication by text message or a lot of phone calls or a lot of something that isn't happening. Uh, And so they're trying to push it and it's not being reciprocated. And then instead of just going, oh, this thing doesn't exist here, they get mad. Like it's like going out on a sunny day and getting angry that it's not raining. It's just not what's happening. Like just move on. And so what are some signs that people should look for if they feel like they may be in a one-sided relationship and 
they've been ignoring it. What are some things that jump out at you that say, hey, you're in a one-sided relationship? Yeah. So I want to actually go the opposite way here, because I think we look for signs when we should maybe be looking for the opposite. Instead of looking for signs of what's good, just noticing what's good. That maybe was a bit confusing. Here's what I mean. Think about relationships you have where it just feels like good, easy flow. You're, you're open, you're communicative, you have no qualms about, you know, should I send this message or should I phone them? It's just there, it's on, there's no question. That is the feeling of connection and a two-sided relationship. Anything that doesn't feel like that is to some extent missing those elements. So really it's about a feeling. I think we're uh, socially conditioned to look for signs, to have checklists, but I really want us to go back to what feels good and what feels bad. So you know what it feels like to feel connected and open with a person. And you also know what it feels like the opposite of that. So just getting really honest about that. And sometimes that really sucks. You know, you want to connect with a person and you're not getting the kind of reaction that you want, or you're not getting the kind of connection you want. And I think as long as we're open and communicative about what we want, you know, that's a beautiful thing, whether it's reciprocated or not. And sometimes you need to be the long arm that extends and says, hey, I like you, I want to connect more, you know, are you into that? And if they're not, they're, they're just not. And that's okay, too. It's not personal. It's a very easy way to do it is to say, what does a healthy, comfortable relationship look like for me? And does this relationship meet that? And if it doesn't, why doesn't it? Hmm. Okay. The, so something I've always heard about, I've read about, I don't fully understand yet. What is a codependent relationship? Oh, that's where we're like plugging into our partner because they're the battery that we need for juice. You know, we go to them for everything. We expect them to meet our needs. We expect them to fit into our story. We expect them possibly to defer to us or perform certain tasks. I mean, there's, there's going to be a container of your relationship where you have agreements of, you know, who does what, the, the mundane stuff. And, but it's a matter of not getting uh, trapped in roles, not pigeonholing each other. Again, some people like this and it works for some people. But if you want to have um, freedom in life and a connected, committed partnership, uh, codependence is not likely going to work unless you're both really securely attached and somehow are codependent but independent at the same time. Hmm. So how do how do we avoid be how do we avoid falling into codependency over time, right? Where it just sort of unspoken becomes the you do this, I do this, I rely on you for this, you rely on me for that. And we've just been together so long that we've silently become codependent without even realizing it because we didn't even know what codependence was. I think you can be interdependent in, in a healthy way where you're relying on each other and falling into comfortable patterns. I mean, if you're feeling unhappy about these patterns, that's something to explore. But um, mostly, probably, we don't avoid falling into codependent patterns. And we maintain an inner work practice and a consciousness practice with ourselves so that we can notice and address when any patterns become entrenched in a way that doesn't feel good or creates problems in other areas of our life. And could it, Stephanie, could it be as simple as having conversations with each other to say, hey, over time, I've noticed, you know, you've just happened to fall into the, or I've, it's the right way to phrase this, you, you, you do X, I do Y, whatever that is. And it's just slowly become that over time. But do you actually enjoy doing X? And do I enjoy doing Y? And should we re-examine or have conversations about who does what, when, and how we can support each other in a more healthy way so that we're both happy versus me being happy and you being unhappy? Yeah, totally. Love it. That's a great way to bring it up. Hmm. And so when you think about conscious relationship training, do you recommend that couples do it together, that you do it independently? What, what generally would you recommend for people who are hearing what we're talking about and saying CRT may be something I want to explore? Mm -hmm. 
I don't recommend either way. It works either way. This is all personal work and it's going to fold out into your relationships, whether your partner is doing the work or not. Um, definitely, I want people to know that both partners do not need to be doing inner work in order for your inner work to be effective and useful and to have a positive impact on your relationships. It's great to have a partner in CRT, in Conscious Relationship Training, uh, to do work with. Uh, it can also be a lot. I think part of a codependent pattern is needing a partner to be doing this work with us. And it can be easy to turn a relationship into a nightmare of processing and psychotherapy, which is not fun for anyone. Relationships being fun sounds nice. There, there's going to be plenty enough challenge offered by life. We don't need to make our relationships extra challenging as well. I love the idea of a strong partnership based on facing life's challenges together and having fun. So processing work constantly with a partner uh, doesn't sound like fun to me. Definitely, it sounds like a great thing when challenges arise, uh, when we need to explore those, you know, who's taking on what role, how are things working for us. Um, when it comes to having difficult conversations, I love having that shared framework for communicating. But doing processing work is, I like to leave that for my women's groups and the group counseling itself, the conscious relationship training. I mean, also, it can be a beautiful stage in relationships. Some people are conscious relationship soulmates, or, you know, that's why they've come to this. And maybe they're not meant to be in a romantic partnership, but them doing this work together is uh, useful and important and maybe fated, if you want to use that kind of word. So, I wouldn't recommend either way. I say whatever feels good to you. But of course, if you're new to conscious relationship training, you might have no idea what feels good to you. So just whatever happens is what happens, I think, and it'll be perfect. Come alone or come with your partner. It's perfect. Love it. The I felt like I was learning a tremendous amount about relationships and shadow work simply reading your Instagram. So I recommend everyone check out Tao of Self, and we'll have that in the show notes and one of the things you wrote was that when confronted or challenged in relationship, we tend to defend ourselves or our position or forgo ourselves entirely or in part in defense of the relationship. So what I was thinking on that one, Stephanie, is what's another option that we might not be thinking about? What's a healthier way than that default position, whichever one is our default position? What's a healthier way to approach it? And and how can we approach those situations better? Yeah, so I'd say uh, open vulnerability. When we're referring to our own experience and being open about that, that tends to connect more with the other person. You tend to solidify a relationship more by being vulnerable and open. So I think that's what I would suggest. And for people who aren't in the work, when you say open vulnerability, can we dive into what that might look like? For sure. Um, probably an example is best. So a classic normal way of talking might be like, hey, I hate it when you do this <laughs> sort of thing. Or, or in the gentle couch, you know, I really am feeling like this or that when you do this or that. And, you know, could you maybe explore something, something? Um, which is often just a careful way of saying, fuck you, you know, instead to say, wow, I notice I'm feeling really afraid right now. Like that's a totally different can of beans, right? The person you're interacting with is going to have a very different way of responding to your admission of fear than to your suggestion that they fuck off because that's your fear response. And then when someone is sharing that with you because you're not used to a partner sharing that How, what's the best way to respond to it mm, to respond to the i'm afraid yeah yeah oh well i mean compassion and connection and a conversation right oh wow Just... what's what are you afraid of you know like get curious with your partner instead of presumptuous yeah and that word jumped into my head as soon as you said it is is one of the easiest ways sometimes to express that openness and compassion is through curiosity is to say, Oh, well, why are you feeling afraid? And can we explore that together? Okay. The, 
if I want to feel seen and understood in my relationship, you say I have to show up and share more clearly. And it sounds a little like I need to be willing to be open and vulnerable. How else can I show up more clearly for my partner so that I can be seen and understood? So showing up for your partner or showing up to be seen? Or showing up myself so that I feel as if my partner sees and understands me. Totally. Yeah, this is great. I I think last year I realized that I might, it might be easier to get to know me if I was more open about certain things. So expressing feelings as they arise and reporting your mind. Like I realized for myself, there's a lot going on internally that I'm not expressing in any way. So I've been making more of an effort over the last year to say things out loud that come to mind. Often these are just absurd observations about the world, um, but inevitably that's expressed through a filter of my experience. So that helps people understand what my experience is. Also just becoming more playful, generally. Play and silliness is really connecting. It creates a great foundation of safety with a person that allows them to bring themselves a bit more. I think that's probably a good start. What are some good ways to introduce that playfulness into the relationship in a way where you you still have those healthy boundaries and it doesn't become too much? And I'll give you an example. Uh, as you said, examples can sometimes help. There, I have a friend that was in a relationship and there was a certain amount of playfulness and silliness that they shared with their partner. And after a while, that playfulness and silliness almost overtook the relationship in a way where there wasn't quite that masculine and feminine energies a sexual attractiveness perspective because it was the silliness and the playfulness almost took the edges off of that. So it became too much. Yeah. They were like a couple of kids playing together. Yeah. A couple of, yeah. Too often. Right. And so there, so it, it, it became a, I, I'm not sexually attracted to you anymore because I feel like we're a couple of kids just playing together all the time. And so I, I lose that edge. Yeah. Well, bringing conscious attention to everything is important. And I think adult play is also important. Um, So being playful and and absurd as an adult is quite different. You know, the Rocky Horror Picture Show is playful and absurd, but it's not like children playing. (laughs) Word play, flirtatious play, I think all of these things are important. And, And part of learning yourself is discovering how many aspects we contain, which is like all of them, like every sort of way a person can be, you contain some sliver of all of that. So there's the child play that you want to engage in, there's the adult play, there's the sex, there's the word play, there's going to be all of these. And your partner is going to be on the same wavelength with you about some of those and not about some of those. And so this is partly why it's so important to have interdependence and a a broad swath of other people to play with and in, in whatever realms feel better there. And it, it may also, and in, in you've emphasized this throughout, come come down to also just communicating, right? So if if my partner is ever getting to the point where they're saying, hey, you got to stop acting like an eight-year-old, it's getting a little unattractive. And I we need to be comfortable enough that she can say that to me and I can say, okay, great. I'll stop that now. Totally. And I think both being invested in in the relationship in terms of polarity is is important. You know, there's a bunch of investments we make in relationship that are important to explore consciously. And if, an, you know, an active sex life and that polarity dynamic is important to you guys, then you're going to have to cultivate it and give it some conscious attention for sure. And for those who may not know, what is what are polarities and what is that sexual polarity dynamic that we're talking about? Well, this is the push-pull, yin-yang, north-south, the opposites that are in everything. So in a masculine-feminine dynamic, which might mean male and female or might not, we all contain uh, aspects of masculinity and femininity within us. 
when you're at the edges of those polarities, there's the most sort of excited tension space between you that it's an energy. And as with any energy, you can cultivate it and work with it and uh, twist it to whatever your desires are. And that's a wonderful feeling having that tension. Is polarity something that you work with in CRT, Stephanie? I mean, it ends up indirectly. We're exploring these aspects of ourself. Yeah, so for sure. So a man learning to be in his power is inevitably becoming more masculine. A woman who's learning to be in her flow is becoming more feminine. Now, either of those might have more or less of one polarity to work on to sort of um, come to some balance that feels good for them. You know, there are plenty of men who are more feminine. They might want to uh, more empower their masculine to have a better balance, or perhaps not. Maybe you want to find if you're a very feminine man, you might want to surround yourself with masculine geography or elements in your home to create that balance. There are many ways to do it. Um, and again, it doesn't relate to male, female in any way. It, are, are there any good books that you would recommend for diving into polarity and understanding aspects of masculinity and femininity and, and educating oneself in this area? Yes, and I don't remember the names of books or teachers or movies or actors or music. So I'm the worst source for that information, but I'm just going to go ahead and say David Data. David Data? Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's got it covered. Perfect. And The Way of the Superior Man was a fun read it's for people who are, are looking for that. The So there's one thing that and, you know, I, I know I've got to do some work on this one because even reading it scared me a little and I'm nervous saying it out loud. One of the things you wrote is that it's important to not hold back in relationships. Articulating what honestly comes up for you in the moment is an expression of the divine. It introduces new dynamics and opens up new pathways forward. What does that look like? for someone in a relationship and why might that make someone super uncomfortable even just reading it oh yeah god it's so important okay so say you've got an electrical outlet right it's just being an electrical outlet then you've got like a vacuum cleaner it's unplugged it's just sitting there being an object you bring them together and suddenly they've got energy and suction and this is the proper full expression of electricity and a vacuum cleaner together right this is the same with any relationship dynamic. We are different people with different people. And that container of our relationship together creates a unique energy that's only available between us in that moment. It can change any time. It's a completely unique creation in itself. Um, and I think that's a really powerful concept. And I think people are afraid of power and afraid that if you have any, then you have to do something with it, <laughs> right? You have to wield it, yield it responsibly and take responsibility for it, which I think is scary because at some level, we all just want to crawl back into our mother's wombs, you know? And not, not, and this ties to shadow work too, right? Often we like to just hide in the shadows. And so we may, you're almost describing a relationship in its fullness and there may be some fear to well, what is that fullness and, and can I live up to it? And is it better to just be comfortable yeah. in the relationship than full in the relationship? It takes energy. You know, we can be awake every day because we know we get to sleep at night, right? David Data talks about this actually about consciousness needs to leave the body because the body needs to regroup. It's the same thing when we're faced with love and a relationship. It's almost like being faced with the idea of having to be awake for the rest of your life. It's exhausting and terrifying. It just makes me want to close my eyes. So part of the trust of that flow too, and part of the trust of learning that we can handle the feelings and sensations in our bodies, that we can have those difficult conversations, that we can say no, that we can ask for space, that we can survive connection and everything that brings. This is a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of trust in ourselves that we can handle it and that the universe has our backs. And what's the 
easiest way to start getting yourself comfortable with it, to start taking those strides personally. And, and you can only do your own work. You're, you can't do the work for your partner. But what, what's the easiest way for someone to start stepping into their fullness in the relationship and, and bringing all of their energy to it versus just being comfortable? Well, this is a Herculean task you've suggested here. So I'm going to wind it right back to just the drink when you need to drink, pee when you need to pee. And I'll add one thing to that, which is just noticing what feels good and what feels bad, really simply. That's going to set your mind on a variety of tracks without you needing to focus on much else. What feels good and what feels bad. Inevitably, your brain is going to start noticing patterns and categorizing all of that. But bringing conscious attention to it uh, is a really important first step in, in self-remembering and in getting connected with yourself as well as the reality of your life and relationships, whatever situations you find yourself in right now. So start to notice what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy, what feels good, what feels bad. Drink when you need to drink, pee when you need to pee. Start to learn slowly boundaries, healthy boundaries, and keep it simple to begin with. And then as you grow in the strength of those, of that boundary setting exercise, start to set boundaries on this feels good. I want more of this. This feels bad. I want less of this and learn to be comfortable saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Inevitably, if you put conscious attention at this, it will start changing around you. There's no way that's the alchemy of giving energy to something. It changes it. The and one of the things that may tie to this that I loved when I read it, and we can dive into it as much or as little as you want. You wrote a conscious code for truth seekers, which is a framework for conscious relationship and radical self-honesty. Do you want to take people into what that code looks like and what some of the key highlights are and that can help them on their journey? For sure. I have to pull it up so that I can remember what it is. Uh, 11 points. The one that strikes me right off the bat is the one about kindness, but I don't think that's number one. Hang on here, just one sec. Yeah, should I just go through them? Sure, yeah. Okay, so tell the truth. I think we've covered this. This is uh, radical honesty, and it's about having faith that you and your relationships can handle whatever it is that you have to say, whatever your feelings are, that they're actually welcome. So that's... Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say it's even in what you've highlighted throughout the conversation, it's even deeper than the surface level truth. Yeah, that's right. And so actually point two is seek your truth. So really discovering what that means for you. So that's that's the shadow work. So we're not talking about uh, what you want to want. We're talking about what you actually want. Uh, we're not referring to truths and beliefs that have been impressed upon you in life, but rather the truths and beliefs that you genuinely hold yourself, uh, which does take a lot of work to sort of ex excavate. Uh, the next point is commit to your body. So this is part of self-acceptance, uh, and this is part of ownership. Uh, whatever your, your body is the vessel for you. It's in whatever shape it's in. You've done whatever you've done to it. This is what's happening right now. So to get comfortable with the fact that this is your body and you're in it uh, and committing to it in some loving self-acceptance way. So treating it well, putting it in healthy situations, nourishing it in whatever way it wants to be nourished. Um, your body is a notification system that gives you so much important data. All of the feelings and sensations you experience um, are information that um, can help direct you uh, in life and emotionally. So very important not to ignore the body. And Stephanie, for those of us, man or woman, who have an uncomfortable relationship with our body and have a challenge with loving it in whatever form it's in, what are, what are some ways that we can practice to get us there 
As an example, you shared in course that I loved and was very challenged by was your mirror exercise. Mm -hmm. It's a challenging exercise. I think we like to judge parts of ourselves rather than appreciating their value. So it's really just a little reframing, you know? I might not like some part of my body, you know, aesthetically. That doesn't mean I can't love it and appreciate its function and everything that it does for me. Does that make sense? So learning to recognize the aspects of you and what they bring to you and maybe learning to reframe away from that story we have in the back of our mind that formed when we were a kid or when we were 18 and a girlfriend said they weren't attracted to X feature we had. And, you know, 30 years later, you're still holding on to that, even though you've, no one feels that way about you anymore. Yes, Clint, literally that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You're in a, we're all in the same boat there. You know, there's all parts of ourselves that we feel judgmental of. And, and often that's our expectations of other people's expectations of us. But there's always something to appreciate. You know, there's always something to be grateful for. If we can just shed all of our resentments that are uh, covering up the gratitude. Which ties to, wow, your very first point in the conversation, exploring assumptions. Because we're still holding on to an assumption we have about someone else's thoughts and feelings 30 years later when they may not even be in our life. Yeah. And they might never have even thought or felt that way. Might have just been a throwaway sentence for them, you know? Yeah. And that throwaway sentence is, may have been embedded in your consciousness or subconsciousness for 30 years. Yeah, totally. Not saying I'm remembering a throwaway sentence, but I may. <laughs> wow. Great point. Yeah. Yeah, we all do. Yeah, it's incredible. Okay. Sorry. Uh, back back on to to your points. Yeah. Well, and of course, it's perfect. The next point is honor cycles and notice patterns. So one of the things that was so impactful for me when I started doing this work was learning about my menstrual cycles, which I sort of just felt averse to. I heard women talking about it as a moon time, and I just got the shivers. It was like, oh, God, these words, you know, sacred spaces and moon time. And I just couldn't deal with any of it. It was too woo-woo. Um, but it was an assignment to start tracking our cycles and our moods. So I started doing that. Boy, is that a revelation. Knowing the patterns around you and, and people who don't menstruate can do this by tracking patterns of the moon uh, and just noticing your moods, your sleep patterns. Like through mapping this, I've discovered when's the best time. And um, professionally, I'm a, I'm a realtor. So when's the best time to hold open houses and negotiate contracts and ask for more money. I can tell when I'm going to be the most magnetic, when I'm going to be the most down in the dumps. There's so much data locked in these patterns. So I, in this case, I'm talking about natural cycles, um, internal or external. But of course, this pattern recognition also loops into relationship patterns and dynamics as well. So recognizing these patterns gives you some permission to operate within or without and um, can also provide a lot of useful context for how you are and when. Uh, the next point is serve a cause. So have a purpose. Be doing something that isn't, I mean, it might still be selfish even though it's service, but do something for those outside of yourself. This creates energy and a feeling of purpose beyond measure. And it's all really great for getting us out of our heads to when you're feeling down in the dumps or when you're feeling too wrapped up in your stories, a really great antidote can be being of service to someone. So just literally asking who needs help with what and doing it. Um, inevitably, that'll lead to some great connection. Uh, and then, of course, just being of service itself is good to do. And how do people find a purpose or find something to be of service to in a way that will fulfill them? Mm -hmm. That's a massive question. Well, it'll either be obvious or it won't. I think there's something to be said for looking around you and seeing what needs to be done in any moment or what you have energy for or what's being asked of you. 
I think a lot of the time people will present you with services. You know, people have always approached me as a leader or had questions for me before I was aware that I was a leader or was any good at answering questions. Um, so I think the universe provides you some options and then you can also seek them out yourself. Again, noticing what feels good and what feels bad and what you naturally have energy for is uh, probably a good place to start there. Mm -hmm. And you may even, you know, as these things tie together, as you're seeking your truth, as you're noticing patterns, you may start to see, oh, I feel good when I'm doing X. I feel good when I'm reading about Y. Maybe that ties to why I'm here and what I should be doing. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. And looking for signs too, you know, if you're, you know, taking the elevator down in your condo feeling like, oh, I should be of service. And then the door is open and there's a notice board saying they're looking for, I don't know, strata council members. Maybe that's your sign. So yeah, being open, I think is good. Some people have to do it. I've done it. I never want to do it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. My heart is with you. <laughs> Okay, so point six is step into the fire, uh, which is all about not avoiding the heat of life uh, or the heat of love or relationships. What more can I say about that? Courage, alchemically, it's a very powerful thing. So avoidance stagnates energy. Um, you know, there are so many ways to step out of flow and to become energetically cloying or avoidant and facing what you fear, um, facing what feels scary, being courageous uh, and not avoiding what's being presented to you is a huge important step in bringing conscious awareness to your life and being an active member of your experience. And Stephanie, this early in our conversation, we talked about how people study and they read and they do the work, but they don't do. And so this one is saying, Hey, step into the fire. You, you actually have to do it. Yeah, for sure. You, you can't, you can't watch life. You have to live it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. In action. I mean, there could also be an inward element of stepping into the fire. As you've said, there's stuff you don't even want to think about. I know for me, if there's uh, emotional or psychological questions, that I want to avoid, I actually can't even hold the question in my mind, like it's gone. Uh, so there'd be some element of stepping into an inner fire there. But yeah, it definitely is a lot. The fire is hotter with other people. The next point, seven, is be responsible for your emotions. So this is about ownership. And this is about holding space for yourself, for your own emotional experience. If part of that is trusting other people to be able to hold your experience as well. Um, and this is why the practice of holding space is so important. As you trust yourself to witness someone else having their experience, you also come to trust that other people can witness you and hold your experience as well. So becoming responsible for your emotions, uh, not putting them on other people, not expecting other people exclusively to handle your emotions. That doesn't mean they can't field your emotions or witness them, but expecting other people or needing other people to do things to fix our emotions or to make our emotions feel better is often impossible and, and frustrating. So taking ownership for our, the way we feel uh, is very important. Is a simple example of that. And we, we often have conversations with our two boys and specifically my youngest who has some similar energetic patterns to his father. And he'll often say, you made me mad. He made me angry. And we try to teach him, well, no, son, only you can make you mad. Only you can make you angry. You're choosing that emotion. You can choose it or you cannot choose it. But we're not making you. No, sort of, and a bit of a reframe, I think, um, is that anger is arising. You know, anger is here. Sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not. Things will cause us to connect with it inwardly, you know? That's definitely one of the things we see in conscious relationship training when we're exploring anger, is we're always looking to get angry at people 
and for people to make us mad. So, and that's part of why it's so difficult for us to express anger, because we feel like we need to be attacking a person, when in fact, we just need to be reclaiming and owning that anger is inside us right now and we're connected to it. It's just, it's so simple, it feels complicated. So what we could say to him in that situation is, it's great that you're recognizing that anger is rising. Now you can choose what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you're feeling angry, buddy. You know, what's coming up for you? Yeah. And and what caused it, right? He didn't make you angry. He may have done something that made anger rise up. Let's talk about what that was because that could be a pattern. You can now start to understand when someone does X, anger rises in me. And and we can start to say, is that healthy or, or is it not? And how to deal with it. Well, and what does it point to, right? Anger arises for a reason. It indicates that there's something you want or don't want, and how can those needs get met? And then, you know, multiple layers of needs. There's the need for whatever is causing the anger to arise. Say you, you want something or don't want something. There's also a need to maintain the relationships with people who you're experiencing anger around. There's also a need to learn how to manage those sensations as they come up and redirect them. So yeah, there's a lot in there. Yeah, but it's given me great ideas on how to, some simple little word tweaks in how to approach it with them, right? Instead of, and you know, for, for parents who may be listening, Stephanie, an example, when you're asking your child to do something and they're responding to you with a very angry words, um, as opposed to simply letting that trigger my anger, it may, may be a better way to approach it. May it be to simply say what you said there, which is, hey, son, it sounds like you're angry right now at what I'm asking you. Can we explore that? Right? Why, why are you angry? What about the way I'm asking you to do something is bringing this anger up in you and how can we explore that together? Now, I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily guaranteeing that I'll have the presence of mind to say that right in the heat of the moment, but it's probably a better way to deal with it. You won't have the presence of mind, nor will he have the presence of mind to be able to answer those complicated questions that even adults would have trouble answering, right? So maybe something like it seems like there's some anger coming up right now. Why don't we take a minute and maybe we can talk about it when you're feeling a little better, you know? Really letting them know that anger is normal and okay and that sitting with feelings is acceptable. The feelings are welcome and we can sort them out together. You know? Because more often than not, the common answer seems to simply be, hey, don't yell at me. Like, don't yell at your mom. Don't yell at me. And then and then the child's saying, oh, well, I'm not allowed to express this anger. I've I've got to lock it in here and put it away. And then when they're older, they don't know how to express it. For sure. And it's so hard. I mean, I can't even imagine what you lovely parents, the amount of time and energy, I can't even imagine. But I know for myself, if a friend started (laughs) randomly yelling, I'd be like, whoa, dude, like, are you okay? What's going on? (laughs) Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. Oh, right. So the conscious code. Okay. No, no, great. So responsible for your emotions. Okay, point A is learn to receive. (sighs) This is a big one with a lot of layers, and it's a huge one in in our women's groups. Learning to receive graciously what people offer is especially difficult for caretakers who've been overgiving their whole lives. So a lot of people give with the hope that they'll receive. It's a, a confused trying to get by giving, not in a conscious way, just uh, in a, I really want to be taken care of. And if I take care of others, maybe someone will return the favor, you know, a, a very subconscious approach usually. And ironically, that's often paired with not being able to receive gifts and service and energy when it's given, right? Not trusting that it's a genuine offer 
sometimes because we're not making genuine offers ourselves. We don't want to take too much from someone, which is a reflection of us giving too much of ourselves. And and it can be uncomfortable just receiving gifts. You know, there are cultural differences. There are whatever your personal experience around gift giving and receiving or energy giving and receiving. Everyone has their own connotations about what that means, whether there are strings attached, whether there aren't. So just coming to trust that when someone or the universe offers you something, you can just graciously receive it. There's a lot of inner work to be done around that. And a lot of, uh, we get in our own way a lot. We interrupt flow a lot. And this is another one of those ways to get, get into the flow. And Stephanie, I don't know if, if you explore this in CRT or in the women's work. In men's work, we often refer to that as covert contracts. And Dr. Rob, Robert Glover for um, No More Mr. Nice Guy writes about nice guys generally do acts of service for their partner. And internally, what they're expecting out of that is X or Y, right? If I mow the lawn and I put the kids to bed, my wife will have sex with me. And then their wife doesn't have sex with them, largely because she doesn't know that there's a co covert contract that her husband expects that. And all of a sudden you're mad at your partner because they didn't live up to a need that you never expressed. Is that term something that you use in women's work? Uh, yeah, probably not the term so much, but definitely that's what all of these assumptions are as covert contracts. All of our codependence, all of our power struggles is all based around covert contracts, ideas we've got around how people should behave with us, for sure. Okay, so the next point is be kind which uh, you just mentioned no more Mr. Nice Guy. So kindness and niceness are not necessarily the same thing. Sometimes they are, uh, but sometimes the nicest thing you can do is leave or tell a hard truth or something that certainly wouldn't be perceived as kind, might be challenging or uncomfortable, but it is in fact uh, the best thing you can do for everybody involved. So practicing grounded kindness and compassion. This doesn't mean overgiving or caretaking. It means connecting genuinely with the love inside you and expressing it uh, and not denying your honest, authentic expression at the same time. And so are, throughout the conversation, you've been talking about being radically and radically honest and compassionate. And so sometimes to your point, it's more kind to deliver a hard truth than to simply let it go. And so it's not burying the truth so you're outwardly kind because in reality that's not being kind nor true to yourself which is an earlier number one tell the truth seek your truth so you can't these are all tying together as we go through the chain yeah yeah i think people confuse uh niceness what they mean is they want everybody to be comfortable all the time and when we're all comfortable, we just stagnate and die. So I don't think that it's terribly kind to just make everybody comfortable all the time. But I can understand the confusion. Yeah, it's a superficial kindness. Let's be kind on the surface so that we're all comfortable. Let's, let's not be truly kind, which will make us uncomfortable and allow us to grow together. Yeah, right. And so surprise, surprise, everyone feels disconnected. Well, of course, nobody was showing up. <laughs> Where was the connection opportunity? You know, it comes with truth. And so uh, a quick digression on that one, because something that you talk about that really resonated with me on this one was your post on relationships with discomfort. And so you specifically noted there are two types of people. Most of us will do anything to keep comfortable and only find, and others only find comfort in being uncomfortable. Can you take us through that one and what you meant by it? Well, there's definitely more than more than the two types of people and there's layers of comfort. Um, so when I talked about myself being a bit of an extremist, and I think you'll find this too, like Miley Cyrus was talking about this on the Joe Rogan podcast about her extremes. And when you've shut down feeling, 
so often this will, you know, people will become addicts or extreme sports people. When we shut down our fundamental feelings, you can only really feel anything at those extremes. So discomfort is like, you know, or, or self-harm or whatever it is, anything that's actually causing a feeling that we feel safe enough to feel for whatever reason, maybe because ironically, it's totally terrifying or life threatening or painful, whatever it is that uh, we've diverted from our uncomfortable feelings and put our energy towards that being possible. So it's a way, it's a, it's a way for us to avoid the feelings that are inside us is to go so extreme that we're just hiding and distracting. And a lot of what you talk about, Stephanie, through throughout your writing and, and the conversation is how often we're simply trying to distract ourselves from what's truly happening or what we're truly feeling. That's right. It's overwhelming. You know, consciousness leads to leave the body sometimes. That's okay. Some distraction is necessary and healthy for sure. Um, but when it's interfering with our lives and relationships is when we want to bring conscious attention to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I resonate with how you talk about this because I'm a little bit like you in that I tend to be quite extreme in everything I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really getting down with the mundanity of everything. Is that a word? Mundanity? I like it. I'm going to say it's a word even if it's not because it works here. Yeah, that's great. Subtle energies, subtle feelings, you know, everything that lies in between the extremes, that's where most of life is happening. So for sure, we want to be able to connect. Learning, and it may not surprise you that tying to that extreme, I don't necessarily have a moderation button. It's I always describe it as a light switch. Some people have a dimmer switch and they can moderate up and down. I can turn the light on or I can turn it off. I haven't learned, you know, I'm 42, almost 43. Maybe I'll get there, but I haven't learned how to use a dimmer switch on anything I do yet in life. I challenge you on that. I bet that's an old story. It is definitely. It definitely is a story I tell myself and people say, well, that's a story. If you, if you can do, if you cannot drink for two months, you can probably learn to just drink on weekends. Yeah, for sure. And I say, you're probably right. Yet every time I've tried, <laughs> it hasn't worked. <laughs> well, maybe you like it and that's okay too. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That's a, it's accurate. It's accurate. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's important to note too. There's a lot of assumptions about spirituality and personal growth, trying to achieve something, some enlightenment or awakening or whatever. A lot of this work is just a lot more mundane. And, and really what I'm here to do is help people connect to themselves in, in ways that make their life and relationships feel good. You know, it's, it's really a lot more simple. And we make things dramatic, right? Our brains and our egos make things dramatic. We're very creative and adaptable. And that's just yet another crafty way for us to enjoy these relatively mundane feelings that we're having. The I, I distracted us from, from the code. I'm, I'm sorry. We were on Be Kind. Yes. And now we're, now we're on to point 10, remain a student of life. Uh, it's pretty simple. Don't stop learning. Um, when you're feeling stagnant, go learn a thing. I have, if I'm feeling glum, I try to learn a new thing and I watch a bit of stand-up comedy to laugh and then like go outside or do something physical. These are sort of my rules for moving energy or getting energy flowing when I'm feeling stagnant. If you're not learning, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you're, you're not alive. You're not paying attention. So, you, you know, you're probably not going to be surprised that I resonate with this one, given we're on the Pursuit of Learning podcast. But I've always said, you know, the day I stop learning is the day I, I'll be dead. And, and I absolutely believe that comment fundamentally is if you're not learning, you're not living. Right. And so I, I find, yeah. Totally. My grandma was still trudging down to SFU for classes at 90. Oh, that's so beautiful to me. I love it. Right? Such a growth mindset. And, you know, we, we may not have time to dive into growth versus fixed mindsets, but that is just the epitome of a growth mindset right there. At 90, still going to take classes. That's just beautiful. I love it. For sure. And, you know, I think it's equally beautiful that there are people who just are not in any way built for that. It's so amazing to me how different we all are 
And it also amazes me how much I thought that we needed to be the same and how now I think that's totally wrong. Who knows what I'll think in another 20 years, but to recognize the differences in how we think and process data and how we want to live and what feels good to us is so important because we compare ourselves to people so much, you know, and I just really want everyone to recognize that the way they are at their core is exactly how they are. And that's okay. That's a good point. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way. Okay. And then on to code number 11. The last point is uh, be responsible in your relationships. And wow, this unfolds in so many layers for me all the time. We fall into relationships a lot of the time. We're in, uh, when I say in this case, unconscious relationships. We're often just spending time with people thoughtlessly. We maybe haven't gotten into this connection for reasons we're aware of. It might not even feel good to us, and we don't know that. If you're a person with relationships in your life, you might notice that you feel more resonant with some of them. You might feel like you want to give more time or energy to some than others. These are important things to notice. Because you're creating your life and relationships, taking responsibility for yourself and your relationships, really honoring your relationships and giving them proper time and energy, that's where you're going to go deepest in connection uh, with other people and also with your inner work. So because this is a, a conscious code for truth seekers, taking responsibility for that depth and your energy in relationships is going to reveal a, a lot about yourself and help you a lot with your inner work. And then just generally connection uh, is better when you're paying attention. I love it. Stephanie, as we approach the end of our time, is there anything that's on your mind that's come up through our conversation that you want to share with our listeners that we might not have covered off? Permission, I think, is the only thing I'll say. Any way that you want to explore being, any archetypes, hats, relationships, moods, behaviors you want to try on, you are allowed. Uh, and you can give yourself permission at any time to explore these aspects of yourself. You can give yourself permission to be wrong is a very powerful one. This is a way to hold space for yourself to discover what your true experience in life is, as opposed to uh, the experience you sort of pigeonholed yourself in. So I'd say give yourself permission to curiously explore. If you need more explicit permission, find me on Instagram and I'll give it to you. That's a great next question. How will our listeners find you? Mm -hmm. My website's pretty constantly in flux, but Instagram is the best spot. So that's Instagram forward, uh, dot com forward slash Dow of Self, uh, T-A-O dot of dot self. Okay. And we'll put that in the show notes so people will find you there. Stephanie, thanks for joining me on The Pursuit of Learning. It was great having a conversation with you today. Thanks so much, Clint. Yeah, great to connect. I had fun. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on The Pursuit of Learning. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and head over to our website, thepursuitoflearning.com, where you will find our show notes, transcripts, and more. If you like what you see, sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, your host in learning, Clint Murphy. Clint Murphy.